Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2022. Welcome to lesson number 8 in the series on Genesis. It's titled The Promise, ready for teaching on May 21, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, May 14. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that there's the story here in the book of Genesis about the life and then the death of Abraham. But during this story of his life, we see the fulfillment of the promise that you made with him. And as we study that this week, we pray that you will bless us, whether we're listening in Bakersfield, California, or Cardiff, Wales, or Petersburg in South Africa, or Bulawayo in Zimbabwe, or Busan in South Korea, or Florianopolis in Brazil, or Wollongong in Australia, or Suva in Fiji, or Honolulu in Hawaii, wherever we are, Lord, in the room or the place we're listening right now, I pray that each of us may be blessed and that your Holy Spirit will guide us as we open your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text today is Genesis 24 and verse 1. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Let's read that again, Genesis 24, verse 1. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Finally, as God had promised, Sarah bore Abraham a son in his old age, as we read in Genesis 21, verse 2. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And he named the baby Isaac. Let's read that story in Genesis 21 verses 1 to 5. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was one hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. But the story of Abraham is far from over, reaching a climactic moment when he took his son to Mount Moriah to be sacrificed. Isaac, however, is replaced by a ram, as you read in Genesis 22, verse 13. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son which signified God's commitment to bless the nations through his seed, as you read in verses 17 and 18. Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. That seed, of course, was Jesus, as you read about in Acts chapter 13 and verse 23. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Saviour, Jesus. Hence, in this astonishing and in some ways troubling story, more of the plan of salvation is revealed. Whatever the spiritual lessons here, the family of Abraham nevertheless must have been shaken by it and the future of Abraham is not clear. Sarah dies after the sacrifice at Moriah in Genesis 23 and Isaac remains single. Abraham then takes the initiative to make sure that the right future will follow him. He arranges the marriage of his son to Rebekah in Genesis 24, who will give birth to two sons, as you read in Genesis 25, verses 21 to 23, which we'll see in a later part of the lesson. And Abraham himself marries Keturah, who will give him many children, as you read in Genesis 25, verses 1 to 6. Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah, and she bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. 
Joxan begat Sheba and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Asherim, Letusim, and Lumimimim, and the sons of Midian were Ephah, Ephah, Henok, Abida, and Eldar. All these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward away from Isaac his son to the country of the east. This week, we will follow Abraham to the end of his life. In Genesis 25, verses 7 to 11, this is the sum of the years of Abraham's life which he lived, 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried, and Sarah his wife, and it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt at Beer Lahai Roy. Sunday, May 15, Mount Moriah. Read Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 12, and Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. What was the meaning of this test? What spiritual lessons come from this amazing event? Genesis 22, beginning at verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, and saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then, on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father? And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Hebrews 11, verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Genesis 22 has become a classic in world literature and has inspired philosophers and artists, not just theologians. The meaning of God's test is difficult to comprehend, however. This divine command contradicted the later biblical prohibition against human sacrifices that we read about in Leviticus 18.21. And you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire of Tumolech, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am 
the Lord. And it surely seemed to work against God's promise of an eternal covenant through Isaac, as we read in Genesis 15, verse 5. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. What then was the purpose of God's calling him to do this? Why test him in such a powerful way? The biblical notion of test in Hebrew nissa, N-I-S-S-A-H, embraces two opposite ideas. It refers to the idea of judgment, that is, a judgment in order to know what is in the heart of the tested one, as you read in Deuteronomy 8 verse 2, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these forty years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And we'll compare that with Genesis 22 and verse 12. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad, or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. But it also brings the assurance of God's grace on behalf of the tested, as you read in Exodus 20, verses 18 to 20. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. In this case, Abraham's faith in God takes him to the point that he runs the risk of losing his future, his posterity. And yet, because he trusts God, he will do what God asks, no matter how difficult it all is to understand. After all, what is faith if not trust in what we don't see or fully understand? Also, biblical faith is not so much about our capacity to give to God and to sacrifice for him, though that has a role, no doubt, as we read in Romans 12 verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. But about our capacity to trust him and to receive his grace while understanding just how undeserving we are. This truth was reaffirmed in what followed. All the works of Abraham, his many zealous activities, his painful journey with his son, even his readiness to obey and offer to God the best of himself, however instructive, could not save him. Why? because the Lord himself had provided a lamb for the intended sacrifice, which itself pointed to his only hope of salvation, Jesus. Abraham must have then understood grace. It is not our works for God that save us, but it is instead God's works for us, as you read in Ephesians 3, verse 8, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And Romans 11.33 O the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out! However much, like Abraham, we are called to work for God, which Abraham's actions powerfully reveal, as we read in James 2, verses 2 to 23. And that reads, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonoured the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called?' 
If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect, and the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. And so to finish the day, what does the story of Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah say to you personally about your faith and how you manifest it? Monday, May 16, God will provide. Read Genesis chapter 22, verses 8, 14 and 18. How did God fulfill his promise that he would provide? What was provided? Genesis 22, verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. And verse 14, And Abraham called the name of the place, The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And verse 18, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. When Isaac asked about the sacrificial animal, Abraham gave an intriguing answer. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, verse 8 said. Yet the Hebrew verbal form can actually mean God will provide himself as the lamb. The verb provide, yielo, y-i-r-e-h-l-o, is used in a way that can mean provide himself or literally see himself. What we are being shown here, then, is the essence of the plan of salvation, with the Lord himself suffering and paying in himself the penalty for our sins. Read John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and Romans 5, 6 to 8. How do these verses help us understand what happened at the cross, which is prefigured in the sacrifice here on Mount Moriah? John 1 Beginning at verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And Romans 5, beginning at verse 6, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There, at Mount Moriah, 
Long before the cross, the sacrificial ram caught in a thicket by his horns, as we read in Genesis 22 verse 13, was pointing right to Jesus. He is the one that is seen here, as Abraham explains later, in the mount where the Lord is seen in Genesis 22 verse 14. That's the author's translation. Jesus himself had pointed to Abraham's prophetic utterance here when he said, echoing Abraham's statement, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. John 8.56 Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 154. It was to impress Abraham's mind with the reality of the gospel as well as to test his faith that God commanded him to slay his son. The agony which he endured during the dark days of that fearful trial was permitted that he might understand from his own experience something of the greatness of the sacrifice made by the infinite God for man's redemption. End of quote. And so to finish today, how does what happened here help us better understand what happened at the cross and what God has suffered in our behalf? What should our response be to what he has done for us? Tuesday, May 17, the death of Sarah. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 23, we see the report of the birth of Rebekah, which anticipates the future marriage between Isaac and Rebekah, as uh, we'll read about later in Genesis 24. Likewise, the report of the death and burial of Abraham's wife Sarah in Genesis 23 anticipates his future marriage with Keturah in Genesis chapter 25, verses 1 to 4. Read Genesis chapter 23. What function does the story of Sarah's death and burial play in the fulfilment of God's promise to Abraham? Genesis 23, beginning at verse 1. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah died in Kirja Abba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan, and Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Then Abraham stood up from before his dead and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. Give me property for a burial place among you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my lord, you are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of your burial places. None of us will withhold from you his burial place, that you may bury your dead. Then Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, the sons of Heth, and he spoke with them, saying, If it is your wish that I bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and meet with Ephron the son of Zohar for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah which he has, which is at the end of his field. Let him give it to me at the full price as property for a burial place among you. Now Ephron dwelt among the sons of Heth, And Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the presence of the sons of Heth, all who entered at the gate of his city, saying, No, my lord, hear me, I give you the field and the cave that is in it. I give it to you in the presence of the sons of my people. I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed himself down before the people of the land, and he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If you will give it, Please hear me. I will give you the money for the field. Take it from me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, My lord, listen to me. The land is worth four hundred shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? So bury your dead. And Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out the silver for Ephron, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth, four hundred shekels of silver, currency of the merchants. So the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, 
which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was in it, and all the trees that were in the field, which were within the surrounding borders, were deeded to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the sons of Heth, before all who went in at the gate of his city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah his wife in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded to Abraham by the sons of Heth as property for a burial place. The mention of the death of Sarah after the story of the sacrifice of Isaac suggests that she might have been affected by this incident, which almost cost her son's life. In some way, Sarah also was involved in the test with her husband, just as she was in his travels and in his occasional lapses in faith, as we read in Genesis chapter 12, verses 11 to 13. And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen, when the Egyptians see thee, that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me. But they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. Though we don't know how much Sarah knew about the incident after it occurred, we can infer that she probably learned of it eventually. Sarah was not the kind of woman who would keep quiet on matters that were of significance or were disturbing her, as we read in Genesis sixteen three to 5 Then Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. And in Genesis 18.15, But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. And Genesis 21, verse 9, And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. His absence and her silence and even the timing of her death following that dramatic event, say more about her relevance to the events than did her physical presence. The fact that Sarah's old age is mentioned in Genesis 23, 1, Sarah lived 127 years, these were the years of the life of Sarah, in echo to Abraham's old age, in Genesis 24, verse 1, now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things shows her importance to the story. In fact, Sarah is the only woman in the Old Testament of whom the number of her years is mentioned, which could show her involvement in the story even after the fact. The focus on the purchase of Sarah's burial place, which covers most of the chapter, rather than on her death, emphasises the connection with the promised land. Already the specification that she died in the land of Canaan, in Genesis 23 verse 2, underlines the rooting of Sarah's death in God's promise of the land. Sarah is the first of Abraham's clan to have died and been buried in the promised land. Abraham's concern about himself, a foreigner and a visitor, in verse 4, and his insistent argument with the sons of Heth, show that Abraham is interested not just in acquiring a burial place. He is primarily concerned with settling in the land permanently. And so to finish the day, read Genesis chapter 23 and verse 6. What does this tell us about the kind of reputation Abraham had? Why is this important in understanding what he was used by the Lord to do? Genesis 23 verse 6. Hear us, my Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our burial places. None of us will withhold from you his burial place that you may bury you're dead.
Wednesday, May 18, A Wife for Isaac Genesis 24 tells the story of the marriage of Isaac after Sarah's death. The two stories are related. Read Genesis chapter 24. Why is Abraham so concerned that his son not marry a woman from the Canaanites? Let's begin Genesis chapter 24, verse 1 right through to 60-something. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, Please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family, and take a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? But Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family, and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your descendants I give this land, he will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, for all his master's goods were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. Then he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, Please let down your pitcher that I may drink, and she says, Drink, and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac, and by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. And it happened before he had finished speaking that, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. Now the young woman was very beautiful to behold, a virgin, no man had known her. And she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. And the servant ran to meet her, and said, Please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. So she said, Drink, my lord. Then she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand, and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also, until they have finished drinking. Then she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough, ran back to the well to draw water, and drew for all his camels. And the man, wondering at her, remained silent so as to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. So it was, when the camels had finished drinking, that the man took a golden nose ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrists weighing ten shekels of gold, and said, "'Whose daughter are you? Tell me, please, is there room in your father's house for us to lodge?' So she said to him, "'I am the daughter of Bethuel, Milcah's son, whom she bore to Nahor.' Moreover, she said to him, We have both straw and feed enough, and room to lodge. Then the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master. As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. So the young woman ran and told her mother's household these things. Now, Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran out to the man by the well. So it came to pass, when he saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrists, and when he heard the words of his sister Rebekah, saying, Thus the man spoke to me, that he went to the man, and there he stood by the camels at the well, and he said, Come in. 
O blessed of the Lord, why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. Then the man came to the house, and he unloaded the camels, and provided straw and feed for the camels, and water to wash his feet, and the feet of the men who were with him. Food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told about my errand. And they said, Speak on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. And he has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female servants, and camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him he has given all that he has. Now my master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell, but you shall go to my father's house and to my family and take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, Perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with you and prosper your way, and you shall take a wife for my son from my family and from my father's house, and you will be clear from this oath when you arrive among my family, for if they will not give her to you, then you will be released from my oath. And this day I came to the well and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if you will now prosper the way in which I go, behold, I stand by the well of the water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin comes out to draw water and I say to her, Please give me a little water from your pitcher to drink. And she says to me, Drink, and I will draw from your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. But, Before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with a pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down to the well and drew water. And I said to her, Please let me drink. And she made haste and let her pitcher down from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give your camels a drink also. So I drank, and she gave the camels a drink also. Then I asked her and said, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, who milk a bore to him. So I put the nose ring on her horse and the bracelets on her wrists, and I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, who had led me in the way of truth to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, And if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing comes from the Lord. He cannot speak to you either bad or good. Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go, and let her be your master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. And it came to pass... When Abraham's servant heard these words, that he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Then the servant brought out jewellery of silver, jewellery of gold, and clothing, and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank and stayed all night. Then they arose in the morning, and he said, Send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, Let the young woman stay with us a few days, at least ten. After that she may go. And he said to them, Do not hinder me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away, so that I may go to my master. So they said, We will call the young woman and ask her personally. Then they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah their sister and her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands, of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Then Rebekah and her maids arose, and they rode on the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. Now Isaac came from the way of Beor Lahai Roy, for he dwelt in the south. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening, and he lifted up his eyes and looked. 
and there the camels were coming. Then Rebekah lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel. For she had said to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Just as Abraham wanted to acquire the land in order to bury his wife, because of God's promise to his descendants that they would have this land, he now insists that Isaac not settle outside of the promised land either. We read that in verse 7 of chapter 4. Also, Isaac's move to bring his bride to Sarah's tent and the note that Rebekah comforted Isaac after his mother's death in verse 67 point back to Sarah's death, implying Isaac's pain at the loss of his mother. The story is full of prayers and fulfilment of prayers and rich with lessons about God's providence and human freedom. It begins with Abraham's words, swearing by the Lord God, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, in verse 3. Abraham is first of all acknowledging God as the creator, which we uh, read about in Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and in Genesis 14 19, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth with a direct bearing on the births of Abraham's descendants, including the Messiah himself. The reference to his angel and to the Lord God of heaven in verse 7 points back to the angel of the Lord who came from heaven to rescue Isaac from being slaughtered in Genesis 22 verse 11. And we remember that. It reads, But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. The God who controls the universe, the angel of the Lord who intervened to save Isaac, will lead in this question of marriage. Abraham leaves open, however, the possibility that the woman will not respond to God's call. As powerful as he is, God does not force humans to obey him. Although God's plan for Rebecca is to follow Eliezer, she retains her freedom of choice. That is, it was possible that this woman would not want to come, and if not, she would not be forced to. Hence we see here another example of the great mystery of how God has given us, as humans, free will, free choice, a freedom that he will not trample on. If he did trample, it would not be free will. And yet, Somehow, despite the reality of human free will and many of the terrible choices humans make with that free will, we can still trust that in the end, God's love and goodness ultimately will prevail. And so to finish the day, why is it so comforting to know that while not all things are God's will, He is still in charge? How do prophecies like Daniel 2, for instance, prove this point to us? Thursday, May 19. A wife for Abraham. Read Genesis chapter 24, verse 67, through to chapter 25, verse 8. What is the meaning of these final events in the life of Abraham? Let's begin at Genesis 24, verse 67. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah, and she bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan begat Sheba and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Ashuram, Letashim, and Limimim, and the sons of Midian were Ephah, Ephah, Hanok, Abida, and Eldar. 
All these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward, away from Isaac his son, to the country of the east. This is the sum of the years of Abraham's life which he lived, one hundred and seventy-five years. Then Abraham breathed his last, and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. After Sarah died, Abraham married again. Like Isaac, he is comforted after the death of Sarah, as we read in Genesis twenty-four sixty-seven. The memory of Sarah must still surely be vivid in the mind of the patriarch as it is for his son. Yet, the identity of his new wife is unclear. The fact that the chronicler associates Keturah's sons, together with Hagar's sons, without mentioning the name of Keturah, suggests, however, that Keturah could, as some have suggested, be Hagar. We just don't know. It also is significant that Abraham behaves with Keturah's sons the same way he did with Hagar's sons. He sends them away to avoid any spiritual influence and make a clear distinction between his son with Sarah and the other sons. He also gives all that he had unto Isaac, we read in Genesis 25 verse 5, while he gave gifts to the sons of the concubines in the following verse. The classification of concubines may also imply that Keturah's status, like Hagar, was that of a concubine. The potential identification of Keturah as Hagar may also explain the subtle allusion to the memory of Sarah as a prelude to his marriage with Keturah Hagar. What's interesting is that in Genesis 25, 1-4, and verses 12-18, to 18, a list of the children that Abraham had with Keturah, as well as a list of Ishmael's children, is given. We've already read verses 1-4, to 4. let's read verses 12-18. to 18. Now this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. And these were the names of the sons of Ishmael, by their names, according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebajoth, then Kedar, Adbil, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Massa, Hadar, Tima, Jeter, Naphish, and Kedemah. These were the sons of Ishmael, and these were their names by their towns and their settlements, twelve princes according to their nations. These were the years of the life of Ishmael, one hundred and thirty-seven years. And he breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt as you go toward Assyria. He died in the presence of all his brethren." The purpose of the genealogy after Abraham's marriage with Keturah, who gave him six sons versus his two other sons, Isaac and Ishmael, is perhaps to provide immediate evidence of God's promise that Abraham would father many nations. The second genealogy concerned the descendants of Ishmael, who also composed twelve tribes. Genesis seventeen twenty and as for Ishmael, I have heard you, behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly, he shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. Just as Jacob's would, as we read in Genesis thirty five, verses twenty two to twenty six, and it happened when Israel dwelt in that land, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob, who were born to him in Padan Aram. Of course, God's covenant will be reserved to the seed of Isaac, as we read in Genesis 17:21, But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Not Ishmael, a point that Scripture is very clear about. 
The report of Abraham's death, sandwiched between the two genealogies in Genesis 25, 7-11, also testifies to God's blessing. It reveals the fulfilment of his promise to Abraham made many years earlier that he would die at a good old age, as we read in Genesis 15, 15, and full of years. Let's compare that with Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and verse 3. If a man begets a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with goodness, or indeed he has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better than he. In the end, the Lord remained true to his promises of grace to his faithful servant Abraham, whose faith is depicted in Scripture as a great example, if not the best example, in the Old Testament of salvation by faith. We read about this in Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 12. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Friday, May 20. Because Abraham was the extraordinary prophet with whom God would share his plans, Genesis 18.17 says, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? God entered Abraham's human sphere and shared with him to some degree his plan of salvation through the sacrifice of his son. Ellen White writes in Testimonies for the Church, volume 3, page 369, Isaac was a figure of the Son of God who was offered a sacrifice for the sins of the world. God would impress upon Abraham the gospel of salvation to man. In order to do this, and make the truth a reality to him as well as to test his faith, he required him to slay his darling Isaac. All the sorrow and agony that Abraham endured through that dark and fearful trial were for the purpose of deeply impressing upon his understanding the plan of redemption for fallen man. He was made to understand in his own experience how unutterable was the self-denial of the infinite God in giving his own son to die to rescue man from utter ruin. To Abraham... No mental torture could be equal to that which he endured in obeying the divine command to sacrifice his son, end of quote. And from the same author, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 171. Abraham had become an old man and expected soon to die. Yet one act remained for him to do in securing the fulfilment of the promise to his posterity. Isaac was the one divinely appointed to succeed him as the keeper of the law of God and the father of the chosen people, but he was yet unmarried. 
The inhabitants of Canaan were given to idolatry, and God had forbidden intermarriage between his people and them, knowing that such marriages would lead to apostasy. The patriarch feared the effect of the corrupting influences surrounding his son. In the mind of Abraham, the choice of a wife for his son was a matter of grave importance. He was anxious to have him marry one who would not lead him from God. Isaac, trusting to his father's wisdom and affection, was satisfied to commit the matter to him, believing also that God himself would direct in the choice made. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, in class, talk about Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac. Try to imagine the kind of faith that this account reveals. What is so astonishing and yet at the same time troubling about this story? Two, what about free will? Why does our faith make no sense without it being a reality? What examples do we have in the Bible of free will and how, despite the wrong choices people make, God's will ultimately is accomplished? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Two Divine Appointments and it's by Theda Pinar. I have a habit of not travelling without first asking God whether the trip would be his will. I live in Ireland while my family lives in South Africa and a sister lives in Namibia. I visit them about once a year. On the airplane, I read the Bible, Ellen White books, and the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. I also always take Streps to Christ in my bag. The books shorten the trip and lead to interesting contacts. Every time I travel, something interesting happens. One time, I started talking with the man seated next to me while waiting for our flight at the airport in Dublin, Ireland. It turned out that he worked as a special detective for the Irish police force and travelled home to see his family in Cape Town, South Africa, every two to three months. We chatted about life while waiting for our turn to board the plane. On the plane, a young woman sat beside me and immediately began speaking. I arrived late at the airport and just made the plane, she said. I am so stressed. God knew that you need to catch this plane, I said. I spoke about how God takes charge of our lives when we allow him. Just before takeoff, the flight attendant told the young woman that she had taken the wrong seat. She left, and who should sit beside me but the policeman? Isn't this interesting, I said. I believe God does things for a reason. You believe in God? the man asked. He asked about my religious background, and I said, I am a Seventh-day Adventist. Isn't that strange, he said. My wife has been trying to convert me for many years. She is a Seventh-day Adventist. I am thrilled to meet you, I said, and I was. We spoke about salvation, and I gave him a copy of Steps to Christ. My wife has been trying to get me to read this, he said. Now I will read it. My two encounters were so remarkable. The ice was broken with the police detective before we boarded the plane. I also was able to mention God to the woman who sat in the wrong seat. Ireland is a very secular country, and it is not easy to speak to people about Christianity. But God provided two opportunities before the plane even left the ground. This mission story illustrates the following components of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan. Mission objective number two, to strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach in large cities and among unreached and underreached people groups. Spiritual growth objective number five, to disciple individuals and families into spirit-filled lives. And the Holy Spirit objective, to be defined as the whole Holy Spirit leads. Read more about this in IWillGo2020.org.
This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.